want to be desperate, Lord, for more of you, for all of you. And we are lost without you. You are our light. You are our guide. You are the destiny of mankind, the desires of mankind. You are the center of it all, Lord. And let our life and let everything in existence revolve around you. Lord, we exhort you this night. We exhort your kingship and your lordship. And even now, Lord, just as your presence is so surreal in this place, let your presence fill every household. And everyone that's watching us online tonight, let your presence fill those households tonight, Lord. You are the breath of life. You are the breath that gave life to Adam. You are the very same breath that gave life to us, Lord. The Ruach HaKodesh, the breath, the wind, the Spirit of the Living God. You are the one who sustains us. And your word is our daily bread. And tonight, Lord, we ask of you, open up again the bakery of heaven and feed us, Lord, with the bread of life. Bless every household, bless everyone watching us tonight. And bless those who are here, Lord, we commit again this night into your hands. And Lord, we thank you that in your presence there is wisdom and revelation and in your light we see light and in your presence there is healing and let your river flow even now into our hearts and we grant you all the permission to do what you want to do tonight Holy Spirit come Lord we invite you come invade us tonight in Jesus name Amen and Amen you may be seated wonderful Lord God Almighty hallelujah praise God Almighty the very air that we breathe comes from him the oxygen sustains our physical well-being to be alive in the body. But it's the spirit that sustains us in our spiritual well-being to be alive in the spirit. And we need both. Hallelujah. Just as, and I say this again, just as the physical body needs oxygen, as a child of God, our spirit, Spirit needs his breath, the breath of God, to sustain us. Hallelujah. To strengthen us, to empower us, to enlighten us. And we need your breath tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we want to give thanks again for we are hearing good reports of cases in Penang. Hallelujah, they are dropping drastically. We thank you, Lord, that you have drawn again a perimeter of the blood of Jesus over this island. We thank you, Father, and we decree that even this restriction control order, this movement, conditional movement order will be lifted. Hallelujah. And Lord, that your People will be given the freedom and the liberty, Lord, Lord, to come to church without any restriction, Lord. We thank you for that, that your protection is over the household of God, over the body of Christ, over your children, every family, every individual, and over this house, Lord. We thank you for that. And we give you praise for that, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God Almighty. 
Wonderful Jesus. If we may go to the slides, hallelujah. Praise God Almighty. Hallelujah. Elijah Academy, the book of Exodus tonight. Wonderful Jesus. Whenever we talk about Exodus, most of the time, we are reminded of this. The parting of the Red Sea. And not only a parting of a Red Sea, but a transition of slavery into sonship. That's what Exodus is all about. An invitation you can put me back on. And an invitation to come to know God as a father and to know God as a bridegroom king. The word exodus is derived from the, the Greek word isodos, meaning going out. To go out from somewhere and to go into somewhere else. So exodus means uh, not just a migration, but it means going out of something and to step into something new. That is the true complete meaning of isodos in Greek. But in the Hebrew Bible, this book is called the Book of Names. <laughs> Strangely, it's called Shemot, or the Book of Names. And I believe the reason why is because in Exodus chapter 1, you will see that it starts with a, uh, a genealogy of the generation that came out from Canaan and they went to this land of Egypt. And here we have uh, Joseph and his family. Uh, we have even the, the 12 brothers of Jacob, the, of Joseph, sorry, uh, the 11 brothers, the 12 sons of Jacob. And the family, the 70 of them who came out from Canaan into Egypt. And prophetically, that is very significant, though many people miss this. But, you know, I see a parallel here. Where in Genesis, it talks about, in Genesis chapter 10, it talks about a genealogy of 70 families after Babel. And you need to understand this because uh, Genesis is not written in a chronological order. So chapter 10 is a genealogy that is supposed to be after chapter 11. Right? That's why it's not in a chronological order because you may say, uh, how come, Pastor, you say 70 families after Babel, but Babel only starts in chapter 11 of Genesis, right? So you need to understand that chapter 10 is specifically uh, set apart to talk about the 70 families of people group that was dispersed. And here we have 70 that went into Egypt, which represents the world, which represents bondage, which represents slavery. And God brought them out of Egypt, meaning that God wants to redeem all the 70 families, all the people group of the world out of their Egypt. God wants to draw us out. He wants to take us into the promise. He wants to take us into a life of promises, a life flowing with milk and honey. Hallelujah. And so, Exodus, this is a book that is very, very intriguing, interesting, and exciting. I remember when I was, what, goodness me, seven, eight years old, and my brother brought me to the cinema. This was back in 1977, 1976. And my brother brought me to the cinema, and that was the first time the Ten Commandments was aired. If you have been a Christian long enough, you will remember that. Hallelujah. And that was like 40 over years ago. <laughs> and do you know that at that time, at that time, 
it was it was permissible for Christian movies to be shown in Malaysian cinemas. Can't remember what's the name of that cinema. We were in Ipoh at that time. Hallelujah. That was how long it was ago, you know. 70, 1976, 1977, I believe it was around that time. The first movie was made about the Ten Commandments. And my brother Bing was the one who, who brought me. I was a little, small boy. And, I, and it, that, that movie was three hours long, you know. Oh, got half time or no? <laughs> Half-time break in a cinema, can you imagine that? And you go out to the canteen to have food and then you go back in again for the second half. <laughs> Hallelujah. Wonderful. And I enjoy that movie, you know. Hollywood have come out with four or five productions after that. But the most recent one was so unbiblical. You know that? The, the most recent one. Why are we talking about movies here? Hallelujah. But you know, Exodus, as I say, is a very interesting book that even Hollywood have tried to make movies out of it. And the best is always the original one. The one, I can't remember the name of that late actor already gone. Charlton something. Yes, hallelujah. Well, you guys all very nostalgic. Praise God. Hallelujah. And we truly and we thoroughly enjoy that, that movie, you know. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, the authorship of Exodus, without any doubt, it was written by Moses, right? The name Moses itself means to be drawn out. Or in another word, you can say he is the deliverer. He was drawn out of the river now, drawn out from the basket. And ionically, the name was given to him by an Egyptian princess. Hallelujah. Drawn out of the river. And so today, the, the church is also a Moses church because we are called to draw the world out of slavery, to deliver the world out of bondage, and to take them to the promised land of God's salvation. Hallelujah. Exodus in chapter 17 and, and verse 14, and then in uh, chapter 24 and verse 4, verse 7, chapter 34, verse 27, these are all in your notes, in your book. All this indicates that Moses wrote intensively during the journey in the wilderness. So Moses wrote this book as well as the other five books of the Torah. And we know that the deadline will be before his death and after the Exodus, which means that it will be roughly around uh, any time in between 1440 to 1400 BC. That was when Moses compiled all his journals and this book came about. Hallelujah. Now let's go to the slide. Basically, Exodus, you can say that if you want to go uh, scrutinize the book, you will see that there are uh, five parts, though there are only three main themes of the book, but you can actually divide the book into five parts where you can see that the first part in chapter 1 and chapter 2 begins with the bondage of the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. And they have multiplied during the time from the 70 who sojourned to Egypt. They multiplied. They, from 70, they became almost 3 million, you know, in the space of about 300 over years. <laughs> and then there was a new pharaoh, and there was a plan. The pharaoh was uh, intimidated by the, the number of the Israelites. They were smart, they were strong, and they were, they were huge. They were, you know, a large population. So the, the, 
the Egyptians were somehow insecure about them being in Egypt, and so there was a plan to destroy them and the plan to destroy every firstborn male. And then the second part, you can see that it speaks about the deliverance of God's people. And you have the plagues, then you have the Passover, and then there was when the Exodus actually started, the coming out of slavery. And then in chapter 13 to chapter 18, it speaks about their journey, the crossing of the Red Sea. It speaks about God's supernatural guidance and provision of light at night, the pillar of fire and the cloud against the heat of the desert, the scorching heat of the desert. And then you see also during the time where God also gave them manna from heaven, their food every day, water from the rock and so on. And then in Exodus chapter 19 to chapter 24, there is the part that speaks about encountering God at the mountain when Moses went up, he received the law. Not just only the Ten Commandments, but 246, some say 242, around that, either 242 or 246, different other laws pertaining to the tabernacle, how to make the tabernacle, Levitical priesthood ordinance, and, and so on. So Moses received most of that at the mountain and then the final part is how they built the tabernacle and so that is the whole main team of exodus so the first two parts happens geographically in egypt and then it was en route and route means the 40 years journey right so then finally you see that uh the last two parts where they built the tabernacle, it was in Mount Sinai. Hallelujah. Sorry, the end route, of course, in Exodus only is about a three-month journey, but altogether in total we know they were in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Seven different wilderness. So they were in Sinai for about roughly one year. To be actual, it was 13 months they were in Sinai. And so that give you a whole outline and a picture of the book of Exodus so you know the contents and what the book is all about. Hallelujah. So put me back on again. Thank you. Exodus starts with the continuation of a Genesis account. The continuation of the family of Abraham. And when I talk about the family of Abraham, I'm talking about Jacob and his sons and his sons' sons and his sons' sons' sons, okay? The descendants. In fact, the four descendants uh, went into the land and these four descendants from, from four generations came Moses because in those days they, they counted, they count a generation as 70 years. Okay, if you will look at Genesis chapter 15 quickly, let's, let me show you something here, which I believe will be a blessing. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Look at Genesis chapter 15, and it was after Abraham made a covenant, he built an altar, and then in verse 13, Genesis 15, verse 13, God said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterward. They shall come out with great possession. So God already gave Abraham a prophecy 400 years earlier about what will happen in Egypt. And then he told Abraham, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. You will not go to Egypt. 
And then in verse 16, it says, In the fourth generation, they shall return here. You see that? So four generation, the fourth generations here, and, and this speaks about the generation that went into Egypt and after four generations, they were delivered out of Egypt again. And it came to pass in verse 17, when the sun went down, it was dark, that behold, there appeared a smoking oven, a burning torch that passed between those pieces. And uh, I spoken about this before. God shows up in a pillar of fire and a pillar of vapor or smoke to show to Abraham what will happen about 400 years later on when he will deliver, Egypt, uh, deliver Israel out of Egypt and there will be a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud. God shown this vision to Abraham back here in Genesis chapter 15. Hallelujah. So, Exodus is a continuation of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Now, I want to say this, and I felt this is very important for us to understand. When God made a covenant, He never forgot. The Israelites were calling out to God in desperation, where is the God of Abraham? Because they knew every, every male and every female born in the Hebrew family knew that God made a covenant with Abraham. They knew that God has promised Abraham that God will give Abraham a land and descendants as numerous as the stars. This is, this is common theology, common knowledge in every Jewish home. And so they were crying out to God, where is the covenant God? Where is the promise? That was why when God appeared to Moses, he told Moses, go and tell them, I am that I am. Meaning that I am the God of covenant. I have appeared, I have spoken. I'm going to fulfill my covenant that I made with Abraham. And so every Jewish family knows that. And there was hundreds of years, the gap of silence. The gap where they were tormented by the Egyptian taskmasters. The gap that they thought that God had forgotten them, God had forsaken them, and they were grumbling and moaning and complaining, and they were being tormented day and night, and they cried out to God, and God heard and God fulfilled his covenant. And let's learn this lesson here tonight. God is a God that never forget his covenant. Once he made a promise with us, sometimes we may go through a season where we can feel like God is so distant, where we can feel like I'm not hearing God's voice. And, and it's like, God is not here anymore. God is not blessing me anymore. God is not answering my prayers anymore. But I want you to know that He shows up suddenly. Because He is a God that never forgets. Hallelujah. And so, Exodus served as that. It served a main team of reminding us again on the faithfulness of God's covenant. Hallelujah. So, Exodus starts with God hearing the miseries of the Hebrew, his people under slavery. And in Exodus chapter 1, chapter 2, again, you can read about how God bless his people, even though they were in slavery, even though they were going through trials. But somehow, God blessed them. And look at Exodus chapter 1 and verse 19. Even the women were so blessed, you know. While they were in, while they were in slavery, look at Exodus 1 verse 19. And the midwife, because Pharaoh told the midwife to kill all the Hebrew babies, and the midwife says to Pharaoh, the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, you know. If I may rephrase that, uh, 
Christian women are not like worldly women. Hello. <laughs> it says, uh, for they are lively, you know. <laughs> women. <laughs> You are a child of God, man as well. You are a child of God. You are supposed to be lively, full of vigority, full of life. And, and these women, it says that they are, they are lively. The, the Hebrew word here means that they are vibrant. They are strong. They are so full of energy and strength. And they give birth before even the midwife comes to them, you know. So it's all self-service. You didn't hear that. I try it again. Can you imagine self-service deliverance of babies? Hallelujah. Okay, he's coming out. He's coming out. Husband, come here. Cash it. Son, cut the umbilical cord. Hallelujah. Self-service, you know. Before even the midwife turn up, it's done. What a wonderful passage to show that God favored his people. Even the, even the Israelites women, when they give birth, hallelujah, it's unlike all the other women. Amazing. Favor of God upon them. Who told you the Egyptians built the pyramids? Hallelujah. It is the Jewish people who built all those structures for the Egyptians. Hallelujah. The smartest, the brightest, and the strongest people on the planet. Hallelujah. A blessing upon them. Praise God. And we are the children of Abraham. Spiritually, we are the spiritual Israel. Amen. So we are unlike the women of the world. Remember that? Hallelujah. Because we are not like the people of the world. We are full of life. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. Wonderful Jesus. And Exodus starts with a plan of God. And God's plan are sometimes the most... I, 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 may, may, may I rephrase it? God's plan are the best script that every Hollywood director would die for. You know the story of Moses being... Safe in the night, brought into a basket. And by the way, the name of the basket in the Hebrew is the same name for the ark. Oh, Noah was in the ark, right? Moses also was in the ark, but a smaller one. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Meno put in the ark, right? And in, let it just flow down the river and, and then went to an Egyptian palace and the princess brought him. What a script, you know. Hallelujah. And, and, and he grew up as a prince of Egypt. Later on, become a fugitive, running away from Egypt. You see, God's, God's storyline is wonderful. His storyline is always interesting. Who told you Christianity is boring? Hallelujah. It's full of adventure. Praise God for that. And so, Moses was raised up. And today, God is raising up men and women. Many Moses are being raised up. <laughs> by the Lord. In fact, the church prophetically represents Moses because we are called, we are called to confront the political powers of nations and to draw God's people out of slavery. Slavery to humanism, slavery to secularism, slavery to the Antichrist spirit. We are to deliver nations out of that bondage. Hallelujah. And the book also in the content speaks about how God is always faithful to provide for us in our journey. 40 years, you know. You know, someone, uh, there was a mathematician who calculated on this. 
because he, he said if you have a ration for one person and you have about three million people, and the Bible says that every day God rained down that portion. So he, he calculated that, right? He <laughs> these mathematicians. And he calculated 3 million people times 300 over days and then times 40 years. And he calculated that and he came to the conclusion that God supplied about 5 million tons of bread. <laughs> Five million tons of bread, manna, for that 40 years. Hallelujah. Praise God. So, God supplies our daily bread. And John, in chapter 6, God, uh, Jesus spoke about that. He said, your father survived on manna. For 40 years. Don't you know that I am the real manna? I am the bread of life. And he is the, the, the source of our living. He is the food for our spiritual nourishment. The word of God, the breath, and the bread of life. Hallelujah. Wonderful God Almighty. Exodus also showed that God will lead his people in the times of darkness, in the time of uncertainties. Hello, do you know that the Arabian desert got no street lamp? One? <laughs> so how could they see at night? <laughs> it was really dark, you know, without any light, and God shows up as a pillar of light. For 40 years, that light never faded. In the daytime, that light turns to a cloud <laughs> to shield them from the desert heat. And this speaks about God as a guide and a God, a provider and a protector. Hallelujah. So, why do we need to worry? In our journey in this world, personal application in our journey in this world, remember God shield us from the heat of the world. He gives us light in the times of darkness and uncertainties. He gives us his manna. He gives us water out of rocks. He gives us provision and protection and guidance to take us to our destiny. That is our Father. In fact, Exodus 19 verse 4, I, I, I cannot miss this one. Exodus 19 and verse 4, verse 5. And look at the purpose of this deliverance. It's not just only to save Israel out of the Egyptians' uh, masters or their, their slavery, their torments, but God has a purpose. He brought them and He said, how I bore you. The word bore is the past tense of bear. It means carry. In the, in the Hebrew connotation, this, this word speaks about putting someone on your shoulder. So God yoked us together on his shoulder, carry us, okay, on his wings, you know. And he bring them to where? To him. The very purpose of God's deliverance in our life is not just to give us a blessing, it's not just to give us salvation, but it's to bring us to Himself. God delivered Egypt, uh, deliver Israel out of Egypt, not just to take them to the promised land and give them a better life, but the ultimate purpose of God's deliverance is always to draw us closer to Himself. And every blessing, and someone needs to hear this, every blessing that comes from God that is authentically from God will always draw you closer to God. He draws us to Himself. Verse 5, and not only that, and then God says, conditional, there's a prefix condition here, if, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant. Two things here. Obey the Ramah 
and keep the logos. Alright? Obey what the Spirit is saying and follow the commandment of the written word. If you would do that, keep the covenant that He made with us. What did He say? You shall be a special treasure to me above all the people of the world. Christians, you are a special treasure of God. You are His his pearls, His jewels, His gemstones. You are His special treasure. And look at verse 6 there. And verse 6, And you shall be a kingdom of priests, slaves becoming priests. Do you hear that? You shall be royalty. A kingdom means a monarchy where there is a king. That's why it's called kingdom. And you shall be priests that serve in a kingdom, a monarchy. And you shall be a holy people. It means that you are set apart. And the same promise that God made with Israel is the same promise He made with us today because we are, we are the inheritor or the inherit we bear the same inheritance as Israel because we are the seed of Abraham in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Wonderful God Almighty. God wants a personal covenant relationship with His children. That is the very purpose of Exodus. That's the first thing that we learn in the personal application column here. He is a personal God who wants to deal and wants to dwell in us and with us individually and corporately. God, second, secondly, God is specific about what is holy and acceptable to Him. That's why He made a distinction. Yeah. He makes a distinction between what is unholy, what is profane, with what is holy. That's why He introduced the laws to show this slave what it means to live a life that is righteous and acceptable to Him. That's why God introduced the Levitical priesthood and the law, the ordinance of that, which we will learn in the book of Leviticus. Someone told me, Pastor, Leviticus, uh, a lot of law and this and that. Can I tell you this in Israel? The book of Leviticus is the main subject in every school. In every school, from primary school and even in secondary school and in universities, you have to study the book of Leviticus. It's mandatory in Israel. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because every Jewish boy needs to understand. <laughs> and every Christian needs to understand that. But that's for Leviticus. That's the next one. Okay, let's come back to Exodus. Hallelujah. We're not done yet. Then Exodus tells us, thirdly, God... Is a God who delivers us out of bondage when we cried out to Him. He hears our petitions. He hears our prayers. He delivers us when we cried out to Him. He is a faithful God. Hallelujah. And the Passover, the Pasach, is a very beautiful picture of Jesus. His blood on every doorpost that stopped the plague, stopped the death, the spirit of death from coming and to take away the firstborn. Jesus' blood on every doorpost or the blood of the Lamb, which represents Jesus' blood. What a beautiful picture of God's protection and redemption for His people. Fourthly, in personal application, the laws and commandments of God's moral principles and conduct is for us to take is, is, is to take us 
into a whole new level of understanding what is holy, what is acceptable to a holy God. And then in the law, in the Ten Commandments, why did God give Moses the Ten Commandments in the first place? Is to show Israel that without God's grace, you cannot keep His commandments. That's why they fail. And the same applies to us today. Without God's grace, without the Holy Spirit empowerment in us, it is almost impossible for us to keep His commandment. How many of you, when someone slaps you on the left, you can turn your right cheek? It's one example, right? And you need grace to do that. How many of you, because the Sermon on the Mount says that if someone comes and asks you, can I have your coat? You say, can I have your shirt? You say, it's okay, I'll give you my shirt. i also give you my coat. How many of us can walk the second mile to help someone? Without grace, you cannot do that. That's why the Ten Commandments shows us again and again that it's impossible to please God. It's impossible to keep His commandment without grace. Which is why the law shows Israel their need for a Savior. Their need for redemption through Christ because all the laws and everything in the Old Testament are prophetic signposts that leads to Jesus. The law that was given shows our carnal failures. It shows that we are weak, we are frail, we are carnal, we are sinful beings. And that's why we need God every day in our life. We need the blood, which is why the blood was introduced in the law, the blood of animal sacrifices as atonement. And Israel knew that, they learned that in the Levitical priesthood, that it is by the death of another animal that their sin is atoned for, not by their good works, you know. Even as far back as the Old Testament, God make a distinction. You are saved, your sins are forgiven by the death of an animal, by blood, not by works. Religion teaches us, you want to please the gods, you must do good work, give more charity. That's religion. Old Testament, even as far back as the Old Testament, the Israelites know that. That's why there are so many, five different types of sacrifices which we will learn in the book of Leviticus. That is by the blood and the death of another animal. This point to Jesus, the death on the cross, that we are saved and our sin are atoned for. Are you getting all this? Christ revealed... <laughs> Moses is like a type of a prototype of Christ because he delivers Israel out of bondage. So he delivers a nation out of bondage, out of slavery. So he's like Christ today because Jesus came to deliver the world, to deliver man out of bondage. Whoever believes in him shall be saved, they shall not perish. Then you have Aaron, which is the first priest. And Aaron also served as a prototype of Jesus because he was the high priest. And Aaron plays the role, in fact, uh, when we come to the book of Hebrews, in a quite a number of months' time, <laughs> I will show you the significance of the nine of oh, sorry of the twelve stones. So maybe in the book of Leviticus we can touch on that. The, the twelve stones on the breastplate of Aaron that represents the twelve steps to the throne of God in the book of Revelation. The significance of that. And why is it that Satan only have nine stones? Just to whet your appetite. You know that Satan got nine stones? He was created with nine stones, but he missed the other three. He was kicked out. Some other time for that. 
Hallelujah. Let's not go there now. Otherwise, we will not finish tonight. Hallelujah. Of course, the Passover blood is the most prophetic picture of the atonement of Jesus in the book of Exodus. Every communion points back to the Passover meal in Exodus chapter 12. He is, Jesus is the lamb that was slain for us. Hallelujah. Jesus also said that Moses wrote about him and he even told the Pharisees that before Abraham was, I am. Now we read that in the English, you know, in John chapter 6. We read that in the English, he was talking to the Pharisees. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. He said, before Abraham, I seen Abraham, before Abraham was born, Haya Shahaya. That was what he told them in Hebrew. Which means that every Pharisee who knows the law perfectly well, who studied and meditated on the law, they understood that when Jesus said that, he is, here it is, he is saying, making a statement that he is Yahweh. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, I am Yahweh. I am the same God who appeared to Moses. I am the same God who spoke to Abraham. I am Hayasha Haya. I am. In English, one simple word only, I am. But Hebrew, Hayasha. Hallelujah. So, Christ was revealed, and in Exodus 3.14, God revealed himself to Moses, and God revealed his covenant name to Moses. Holy Spirit revealed... Oil in the Bible symbolically represents both the Holy Spirit and his attributes. And in Exodus, uh, when God told them to prepare the anointing oil, all this is, uh, is I, I would say, is like a, a prototype, a prophetic prototype of the new. Testament anointing in every believer because we are now the temple, the tabernacle of God. And as there are oil lampstands in the tabernacle of Moses, there must also be lampstands. We are the lampstand. There must be oil in us, right? So all this points to the Holy Spirit empowerment, His virtues, His attributes. Hallelujah. Then you can see also uh, in Exodus 34 from verse 6 to verse 7, the list of the fruit of the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the attributes of God as being merciful, gracious, long-suffering, good, truthful, forgiving. These are also the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Then let's go to Exodus 31 verse 3 to verse 11. And here you have this uh, craftsman called Bezalel and Aholiab. What Liab? Aholiab. Hallelujah. Let's just go there very quickly. Exodus 31. And look at verse 3. Well, let's start from verse 2. Exodus 31, verse 2. See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And look at verse 3. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God. So, back in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit can infill an individual, right? And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of what workmanship or craftsmanship. And verse 4, to do what? To design artistic works, to work in gold, in silver, in bronze. Verse 5, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of craftsmanship. Verse 6, 
And I indeed have also appointed with him a holy up. <laughs> and these are people that were filled with the Holy Spirit to do all those beautiful, intricate design. In fact, the lampstands itself, the lampstands, okay, was made of about 75 pounds of pure gold. Pure gold is soft in texture, right? That's the good advantage of that. But here it is, when they made the lampstands, and Bezalel was one of them, and they had to shape, they had to hammer one big lump of gold without any machinery, you know, and cannot even separate the gold, cannot cut and mix and join this part because the lampstand, as you can see there, all right, it was one big piece of gold being hammered and shaped into an engineering design of heaven. How could man do that? Cannot. Man cannot do that. But how did they do that? Filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. So the Bible tells us that even back in Exodus, when they built all those things, when they designed the tabernacle, when they built all the things that God asked them to do, God empowered them. I'm hearing something now. Oh Lord, that is wonderful. Thank you for that. The Lord just spoke and said this. He will always empower you to do what he called you to do. I like that one, Lord. Thank you. He always empower you. He gives you his Holy Spirit. He gives you wisdom and revelation and knowledge and skills to do what he called you to do. Hallelujah. So if God calls you to, to be a cook, uh, ask him to fill it with his Holy Spirit. Your curry will taste better. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, wonderful Jesus. Everything that you do will become the best because he fills you with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Wonderful God Almighty. Wonderful Lord. And of course, we see the Holy Spirit as the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. This is the manifestation of God's spirit as a fire and a cloud because all these are a symbolic representation of the Holy Spirit. Wonderful Lord. Now, I want to take you to the slides. And it's something that we don't want to miss out here are the plagues. The first plague, as we know, is the blood, the river now, and every water source turned into blood. The Egyptians, if I'm not mistaken, they have 90 over, 92 around that, 90 over different deities, gods and goddesses that they worship. The main two are Iris and Ra, God of light and darkness, death and life and so on. Now, there it is, I, Ra and Iris, okay, the last play. Now, they have this God called Happy. And to the Egyptians, Happy is the God of River Nile. Because in that time, remember, they don't have Google Maps, right? So to them, to the Egyptians, they say that the River Nile is the biggest river in the entire world. To them. Okay? So they say that this River Nile is the greatest river, it's the river of the gods. They call it that. 
And so they say that there must be a god that got this river. And the Egyptian god is the god Hapi, a father of life, of all the sources, because the river Nile is the life source for the Egyptian. Their water source comes from there, their fish, their food, you know, everything for their washing, for, for agriculture, everything comes from the river. So it is the river of life for them. And God confronted the Egyptian god Hapi by turning the river into blood. The first plague. And I also mentioned this, that is also God revenging the spilled blood of the male Hebrew babies that were killed and thrown into the river now. Remember that? God avenges the death of his people. Because Pharaoh killed all those, all those firstborn males of the Hebrew. And not only that, he killed them, you know. Stabbed those babies uh, and, and, you know, they were thrown in the river and the river was full of crocodile, you know. So when they killed the, the, the Hebrew babies, the river now turned red in a sense because so much blood was spilled. Babies were eaten. They became crocodile food. You know the crocodiles in the river now can be 25 feet to 30 feet long? So, the famous one in Malaysia is called Bujang Selamat, you know, in Sarawak. The one only 20 feet. This one, now 125. Bujang tak selamat, you know. <laughs> and, and these babies were thrown to the river, eaten alive. I mean, they were dead already, right? But they were eaten by crocodiles. Fat became crocodile food. So, the first plague, God revenge the death of his ch children turn the river into blood and also to confront the Egyptian god of the river Nile, Hapi. Second plague, frogs. Egyptian also got a god called Hak. So God brought the frogs and the Egyptians, the magicians were also praying to their god, Hak, the god that has the face of a frog. And trying to ask the god Huck to chase away all the frogs, but Huck was powerless. <laughs> you see, in all the plagues, let me put it here, in all these plagues, God is showing that there is a great and mighty God that is more powerful than all these fake gods of the Egyptians. Okay? That's why it's a direct confrontation with all the gods. <laughs> Third plague lies, Kutu. Huh? There is a god of lies, you know, called Hato or Nut. <laughs> See, it's pronounced as Nut. <laughs> Hato and Nut, okay? Again, uh, the lies, the flies, Belzebub, you know that? There's a famous name in the, in the gospel because they call Jesus Belzebub. Flies, a lot of the flies. So you have Shu, Isi, and all these. Then you have the god of livestock. Livestock means all the domestic animals, and the god of livestock is called Apis. So God was confronting all these Egyptians, uh, gods and goddesses, and then you had the boys. Sekhmat is the Egyptian god of healing. And so when the Egyptians start to have boys, and hey, we are not talking about us, you know, I mean, abscess. Uh, we are talking about big boys on their hands all over their bodies and all that. And this is painful, you know. You got one little abscess, so you also complain already. This one, full body full of boys. And they were calling to Sekhmat to heal them. But Sekhmat was powerless. So God was showing them that there is only one healer. And his name is not Sekhmat, it's Rafa. 
Then you have hill. Gap is the Egyptian god of the sky. So God rained down hail and the Egyptians are calling to Gap, Gap, you are the God of the sky, protect, stop the hail. But the hail keep on coming. In fact, the hail continued to come for three days, you know, non-stop. And so every, every, uh, all, every one of these plagues was, I say, a direct confrontation. Then you have locusts. And you have the Egyptian god Serapis, eh, right? Darkness, the Egyptian god of darkness is Ra, the god of the underworld. Because the ninth plague was complete darkness. Again, three days of darkness. And again, that is prophetic because, it, hear this, Jesus was crucified and there was again darkness, <laughs> three days. Not physical darkness, but spiritual darkness. And the disciples were so uncertain about what's going to happen. And then came the resurrection day. And Jesus became the firstborn of the resurrection. And the last plague, of course, is the god Iris. Because the Egyptian god of life is called Iris. So when the firstborn died, they called out to Iris to give life, but yet there was no resurrection. So all these plagues, like I say, are God's direct battles with all the Egyptian deities to show to the Egyptians that there is only one God and the true God, and He is the God over every other beings. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. So, let's go to the personal principles for godly, righteous living. And the first one, growing in godliness. Exodus teaches us that godly living is simply living with God in our lives and His life in us. He gives us guidelines to help build our life on his precepts. God calls us to acts of faith that build godliness. Without faith, our religious acts are hollow and, and self-will. So in Exodus chapter 3, verse 3, it speaks about Moses at the foot of Sinai and somehow he was drawn. He was drawn to the burning bush, okay? And from there, his life began to transform and he was now being utilized, partnering with God to become a deliverer. Participate regularly, chapter 13 there again, participate regularly in the Lord's Supper. Why do we do that? Because the Passover points forward to our ultimate deliverance and our breakthrough in Jesus. The Passover reminds us of our covenant with God, that He is a God of covenant. And all this will help us, it will help us to stay on track in the life of walking in godliness, pursuing holiness with God. So that is the first principle and application that I put there in your book. The second one, cultivating dynamic devotion. Devotion to God begins with growth in knowing God. In Exodus, God reveals part of his nature and character. Knowing God in truth will dramatically impact our life. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God revealed himself to Moses. He says, I am that I am. Understand this, God is what his name is all about. Everything that he say he is in the, in the word is true. If he say he is our provider, he is our provider. He is Jaira. If he say he is Rafa, he is our healer. If he say he is our Sekanu, he is our righteousness. Everything that God says in his word is true because it is part of the revealing of his character. 
And know this, when God revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 3.14 at the burning bush, he says, I am that I am. Moses starts a journey of learning about God. He, he began a journey. He started a journey. And he began with that. He, he started to know God as a God of covenant. He didn't know everything about God at that time, you know. In fact, Moses took 40 years after that to deliver Egypt, to deliver the people out of Egypt. And in that 40 years, he began to know God little by little, more and more each day, every day, every month, every year for 40 years. He began to know more and more about this I am that I am. So, cultivating a dynamic devotion to God begins with a simple step. It takes a step of faith, it takes a step of hunger, a step of pursuing God. In pursuit of Him, you will get to know Him more and more each day, more and more each month, more and more each year. In fact, can I bless you with this? And I will remind, I will say this again at the end of the year. Wash night service. Every wash night service, 31st of December, I would spend the whole day in God's presence to reflect on my life, how I've walked with the Lord for the past 364 days, and then to reflect on how have I progress? Have I grown? Have I matured? I will reflect, and this is self-examination because the Bible says we are to grow from glory to glory, right? We are to grow from faith to faith. And I will reflect on this every end of the year so that I can be better for the next year so that I can serve God more effectively the next year, that I can be more mature in my character for the next year. And this is what cultivating a dynamic devotion is all about, that we know God just like Moses knew him, and we hunger for him to the point that we want to tell God, God, I want to see you face to face. And God even spoke to us last night during the api. If you still remember that, those of you who were here last night and those of you who are online, you want to hear this. You know, last night, before api started, I sat here for about an hour waiting on the Lord, asking the Lord, Lord, what are you putting in my heart for us to ask you tonight? That was yesterday, last night. And the Lord put this in my heart, and I want to just repeat this again for those of you who miss it. He put this in my heart, and for the benefit of those who are also watching us online. He says, ask me for the heart of Enoch. We know in the Bible, right, Enoch walked with God until he was no more. So my wife was a little bit concerned about that prayer. He said, what if you ask God for a heart of Enoch and then suddenly you are no more because God take you home. I say, don't worry. God will not take us home. God wants us to build him a home. Yeah. All right. So ask God for the heart of Enoch means ask God for the heart that longs for him. Enoch have a heart that is so in love with God, full of intimacy for God until he walked with God, until he was no more. God took him home, you know. Ask God for that, for a heart that yearned for him, longed for him, that wants more of him. That's called cultivating dynamic devotions. Back to the slides. Receive God as the Lord who heals you. 
Now, I want you to understand something here because in Exodus 15, 26, 25, 26, he revealed himself, I am a Yahweh Rapha, the Lord who heals you. Now, God's nature is to heal and to make us whole. Rapha is not only physical healing, you know. Rapha is emotional healing, mental healing financial healing, relational healing, as well as physical healing. That's why when God says, I am the God who heals you, it's not just only healing you of a sickness, not just healing you of a physical ailment, but it's healing you of everything to make you whole and complete. That's why He is our Rafa, our healer. And He is the same. Receive God as that, that He is our healer. Then rely upon God as our banner. Why did Moses say, you are the Lord, my banner, you are Yahweh Nisi? Because every time Moses lifted up his rod, the Israelites prevail against the Amalekites. Who are the Amalekites? The thief who come and steal at night. It's a Hebrew derivation of the word Amalekites. Not the one who loved to fly kites. <laughs> the thief will come and steal at night. And the thief, demonic spirit, wants to steal away our peace, our joy, our blessing, our promises. And every time Moses lifted up his hand, the Bible says what? The Israelites prevailed. We're talking about slaves, you know. Who do not know how to hold a weapon. One. All those years, they only know how to turn their cheek and let their Egyptian masters slap them. They never knew how to fight back. They were never taught how to fight, you know. They were only taught how to be beaten. Every time when there is a confrontation, they know how to bow down and let their oppressor beat them on the back because they grew up as slaves generation after generation. But now God raised up this slave to become warriors. <laughs> and not by their supernatural, not, sorry, not by their physical skills. Not, they have never been trained as soldiers. They do not know how to lift up a weapon and fight one, you know. But whenever Moses lifted up the rod, go back and read Exodus 17. Every time Moses lifted up the rod, it says that the children of Israel prevail against all these seasoned thieves, you know, the Amalekites. Supernaturally, God gives us supernatural victory every time we know how to lift up our hands in praise. You hear that? Lifting up the rod is lifting up our hands in praise. And Moses got tired, you know. Of course, she was tired. Lah. 80 over years old man, you know, lifting the rod lah, from morning till night. Who won't get tired, right? Sometimes, and, and look at the story again. And it says that Aaron and her, Aaron, the priesthood, her, which is from the tribe of the Kohat, the Kohatites, the worshipper. You know, God will bring the priesthood, the worshippers to come and stand alongside you, Aaron and her, to help you lift up your rod. So church, this is good news, you know. Sometimes when you get tired fighting your battles, you need the body of Christ. We need one another to come and stand alongside us. Because our hands can get tired praising God. Are you hearing me? Sometimes we, we get tired fighting the enemy. Of course, we know God fight for us. But sometimes we need encouragement. Right? We need motivation. We need brothers and sisters to come and stand alongside and say, Ka yao. <laughs> Add on oil. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Add on the fire. Burn Fight, burn hotter and brighter and they come to encourage us. That's why iron sharpens iron. 
Then in verse 13 of chapter 31, back to the slide, pursue God because He is the one who sanctifies us. He is the one that makes us holy. So these are some of the principles and application that I take out from the book here to show you. Next slide. Pursuing holiness. God called us to be holy. To be holy means to be set apart for His purpose. To be set apart for God's purpose doesn't mean you have to leave everything and go and stay in the cave. Are you all still here? Hallelujah. Because some people, they think that to be holy means I must go to the Penang Hill and meditate 40 days, 40 nights. <laughs> They want different holiness, you know. <laughs> to be holy, to be holy for God, all right, means that we know that even though we are in the world, we live in the world, but we are not of the world. We are the people set apart for Him. We have a purpose, we have a calling, we have a destiny, we have an inheritance. And we are the people that are chosen by God, a special treasure, a holy priesthood. Hallelujah. And in Exodus, in chapter 7, go back to the slide, chapter 11, all that, you can see that God deals differently with His people. Okay, these are some of chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. You can read about that. Rely on the blood of Jesus, chapter 12, to protect and cleanse you. Remember, it's not by our works, it's by our faith. Is by our surrender. If you say you have faith, then how much faith you have is determined. I want to say this very clearly. How much faith you have is determined by how much you are willing to surrender and trust God. That is so important. I'm going to say it again. How much faith do you want? You want your faith to increase, right? You cannot go to a classroom uh, and get faith certificate. Oh, I went to the class, I studied, I passed, I got master degree, so I got faith certificate. No, 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 no. Faith don't come in the classroom. How much faith you want is determined by how much you are willing to surrender your life and trust completely upon God. When you do that, your faith increases. Hallelujah. And of course, faith also increases by hearing. Hearing the word, hearing the voice. Faith increases by encountering God. Faith increases by walking intimately in a relationship with God. But remember this, rely on the blood of Jesus to protect, to cleanse you not by our work, it's by faith in what He has done for us. That's why I have faith. I have faith to believe in the promise of God that He will protect ARC. Amen. That he will protect every one of us. And it's not by works, it's by surrender. It's by trusting in the Lord's provision. That's how faith works. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. And at the end of the day, we don't take any credit. All glory belongs to Him. It's not our works, it's His work. Hallelujah, Lord. Go back to the slide. I like this one. I don't want you to miss this one. Special treasure, chapter 19, okay? <laughs> special treasure. God calls you a special treasure, you know. Special treasure is what God calls those who obey His word. I shouldn't put it what I should put who. Special treasure is who God calls 
or what God called those who obey His word and keep His covenant. Now, special treasure. Put me back on here. Oh God, I like this one. Let me explain this in a way that you can understand. In biblical times, in biblical times, there are two types of special treasure. One is golden goblets, you know, cups, okay? Golden plates or goblets. That's why Timothy, 2 Timothy says, in the house, in the mighty house, there are vessels of gold, you know, vessels of silver. So, in biblical times, special treasures are golden cups or golden plates that are only used for weddings or any kind of very special events or during the feasts, important feasts, they take out this special treasure, right? So it means that when God calls you special treasure, it means that you are so priceless, so worthy, so valuable, that you are not just used for ordinary things, but God reserves you for special events feasts, weddings, important things, important occasions. That's one term for special treasure. Another definition for special treasure are the necklace that noble people wear to show off. You hearing this? Special necklace, okay, full of gemstones, diamonds, rubies, and all that, and big chain. In those days, they wear that, you know, kings, queens, noble people, they wear that. These are also called special treasure. And they will put them around their neck to show off their wealth or to show off their position of royalty. Kings and queens, they wear that, right? So when God says that you are a special treasure, it means, number one, you are unique, you are valuable, you are so priceless and so special to Him that He, he used you for great, important events. Okay? Number two, He's so proud of you, He wants to show off who you are to the world. They didn't get that long. He wants to wear you around his neck like a necklace so that he can show off to the devil, see, my people, the church, they are sparkling gems. Hello? They are my treasure, they are my gold, my gemstones, my rubies, my diamonds, my sapphires. And God wears that like, like a chain, like a necklace around his neck and to show off. He wants, he, oh, Shotorakama, you got to get this theology right. He wants to show off the church, you know. But we are not to show off ourselves because we are to show God in ourselves. Because we want to show off God, God wants to show off the church. Because when He show off the church, the church show off God. You didn't get it. Do you get that? Hallelujah. Oh God Almighty. You are His special treasure. Back to the slice. The walk of faith, the walk of faith starts with spiritual, universal wisdom of God. Godly wisdom enables us to apply truth rightly. And the Holy Spirit helps us to practice wisdom 
as a godly discipline, leading to a full and vibrant life in Him. And in Exodus 19, Exodus 33, rely fully on God to enable you to obey His Word, knowing that His Spirit set you apart. Exodus 20, verse 20, learn reverence for the Lord. It will inspire and encourage you to obey Him fully. Reverence means to have a holy respect for God. Respect Him as the King of Kings. Hallelujah. Acknowledge that your skills and your abilities are God's gift to you. Thank Him for them. Use them wholeheartedly for His glory. Just like He anointed the craftsman to, to build a tabernacle, know that God wants to anoint you, wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit to become the best cook, the best businessman, the best teacher, the, the best artist, the best musician, the best technician, the best engineer, the best doctor. Because in God's plan, He wants to make you the head and not the tail. But this can only happen when you fully obey Him. When you fully follow Him. Obey His voice. Obey His covenant. Obey His commandment. When you do that, you become the head and not the tail. And nobody will step on your tail. And you won't step on people's tail because no more tail, all heads. Hallelujah. And the fifth one, slides, keys to understanding authority Recognize that it is the Lord who places leaders in positions of authority. Exodus teaches us to support, encourage, and follow God-ordained leadership. So in chapter 17, uphold the leaders God has placed in your life. And the, the passage there speaks about Moses. Now, Moses, like I say, was 80 one years, 80, 81 years old at this time in the place of Rephidim. Just before they encounter God, you come to Rephidim where you have to do battles. Spiritual battles always precede encounters. Rephidim before Sinai. Okay, now come back to this. Hear this. Moses was up there whole morning, you know, with the rod, and he lifted up the rod. I spoke about that just now, right? And he, in the afternoon, he got tired. He was so tired. And he, hear this, you know, whole day, morning till evening, he was holding the rod. No time for the lunch break, you know. No toilet break, so, you know. <laughs> Maybe he cannot tahan and he just open the pen, hold the rod. I don't know, right? But here there is no break at all, right? And, and he was upholding praises so that Israel will overcome the enemy. Now, Aaron and her saw that. No one told them what to do, but they took the initiative to go up the mountain to stand alongside their leader. You hear that? Because they knew that sometimes the leader also need support. Unity works best. Unity, it takes unity to conquer a giant. Right? And so they, they came up there and they stood alongside Moses, their leader, and they lent support. In fact, I had a vision of this, you know. I have a vision of this, where in the vision I saw, it's like when they came up to Moses, it's not that only they hold up Moses, because remember Moses had been standing, you know, and when they came up, they allowed Moses to also lean on their weight. That Moses was able to lean on both of them, you know. Lean on here, lean on there, and sometimes leaders also need others to come alongside them, that we can lean on one another, that we can, hear this, we can be strong together. 
And when we do that corporately, we are able to overcome our giants. Hallelujah. So go back to the slide. Uphold the leaders of God, that the leaders God has placed in your life. Walk alongside them, pray for them, encourage them when they are tired, offer to help them in practical ways. Doing so honors the Lord and help us to fulfill His purposes. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the book of Exodus that reminds us again that you hear our prayers. You see our trials. You understand our affliction. And Lord, you are our deliverer and you are quick to come and deliver us out of our bondage. We thank you, Lord, that we have been set free from the bondage of Egypt, from the bondage of slavery to sin and slavery to the things that's of the world, the enticement and the temptation of Egypt. And we thank you, Lord, that today we are on a journey of discovering you, just as Moses and the Israelites were discovering you in that journey. And we thank you, Lord, in our journey, we will always see manna, the word being released into our life, the bread of life given to us every day. That we will see rivers come out from rocks when we are thirsty. Lord, you satisfy us with the river of life. We thank you, Lord, that in times of darkness, there is a pillar of light that shines and illuminates the path for us to walk on. And we thank you, Lord, when things get too hot, there is a cloud that shields us. Lord, we thank you that in all our ups and downs, left and right, you are just bringing us and aligning us into the straight path, a narrow path indeed, but a straight path into our destiny. Father, we thank you for reminding us again in the book of Exodus that you have called us to be a special treasure, a chosen generation set apart for you, Lord, that you deliver us because you want to draw us to yourself and to know you intimately. Bless your church in this, Lord. Bless the hearers online, Lord. Bless us in this. And Father, use us also like Moses to deliver those who are in bondage and to take them from darkness into light. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. We'll see you next Thursday. Hopefully, no more CMCO. Let's pray for that. Hallelujah. Praise God.